Welcome to Science News. We're here in New Orleans at the 2013 Annual Fall Scientific Conference of the Council for High Blood Pressure Research of the American Heart Association. And today we're going to be speaking with Dr. Richard Wainford, who is one of the finalists uh, for the Goldblatt Award, a very important award of our council that recognizes a newly independent scientist uh, and their contribution to the field of hypertension research made as an independent scientist. And I would point out the imp this award is important because many, many of the major contributors to hypertension research that are now in the council and have contributed to the council's activities for a long time were, in fact, Goldblatt Award winners. I want to start off our conversation today by just uh, asking you, Richard, uh, a little bit about your educational and, and research background. That is, how did you get to where you are now? Okay, well, I first started off, I did my undergraduate in zoology in Cardiff in Wales in the UK, ah. and that triggered my interest in control mechanisms and interactions between organ systems. I then progressed and changed that into a PhD with pharmacology, which I did in the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, ah. and that stimulated my interest in molecular pathways and signal transduction. And I had a little bit of in vivo work at that point, and I thought it was important to translate my in vitro and molecular biology skills into an in vivo environment. And I was fortunate enough to have the training opportunity to move to America. And I moved to Louisiana State University mm. Health Sciences Center under Dr. Capusta, ah, yeah. who trained me in whole animal integrated physiology, the ability to measure blood pressure, the ability to comp put compounds peripherally, centrally, and tease out the pharmacology underlying the current medications we have for high blood pressure research. And I was fortunate enough to be trained very well and given the freedom to develop as an investigator. I initially was trained on the mentored NIH COBRA program which was my first step into independence, which was then thankfully translated into an American Heart Association beginning grant in aid. Excellent. It was my first independent award, and over time and with great training and mentorship, I then progressed to receive my R01 in 2011, and then I moved to a fully independent position at Boston University in the Whitaker Cardiovascular Institute, where I have my own laboratory, and I've been running my own research program for two years now. Excellent. Well, it sounded like you and Dr. Capusta were a very good combination. That is, Absolutely. your molecular expertise and his animal physiology. It expertise. came together beautifully. He needed my expertise, and we shared the skills, and it's worked to both of our benefits now. I wouldn't be where I am without him, and I know that I helped contribute to his research program, and we continue to work and collaborate together. It's the way it's supposed to work. Excellent. It's good to hear. So you'll tell us a little bit about the work that you're going to present today. It looks very, very exciting. I've already read your abstract, of course. And, Thank you, Greg. Uh, um, we'd really like to hear a little bit more about it. And, and again, I don't want you to give away too much, but uh, um, you sort of give us the main, uh, main thrust of what you're going to be doing. Sure. So what I'm really, really interested in is trying to understand salt-sensitive hypertension. It's a huge component of hypertension. It affects about 50% of people who are currently hypertensive. Mm -hmm. And at present, we don't understand truly the mechanism driving salt sensitivity, and I'm more interested in like the therapeutic avenues that haven't been explored yet. Excellent. So there's been a huge amount of research exploring what's gone wrong, what's deranged in a salt sensitive person. I'm very interested in flipping that on his head. There was a hypertension editorial a couple of years ago acknowledging that we haven't really focused on the anti-hypertensive systems that are working in a normal person. You or I could eat a bag of chips right now. Your blood pressure may not go up, my, my, my blood pressure may. Yeah. What I'm interested in is what is working in you? What endogenous systems are working to get rid of that salt? Maintain your blood pressure. Yeah. And if we can understand that better, we can target therapeutics to take advantages of those systems and apply them in a salt sensitive background. That's a very interesting strategy. Excellent. It seems to be working out and what we found is, so I'm very interested in the central neural control of blood pressure, mm -hmm. something I know you've been working on for decades, so it's Absolutely. a pleasure to be here <laughs> with you. <laughs> Thanks. And what we found, or what I believe we found, is we found a central molecular pathway that's been overlooked that actually directly regulates renal sympathetic nerve activity. If you don't have this pathway present, your body is unable to turn down the activity of the renal sympathetic okay. nerves and facilitate the renal excretion of salt. So if this is impaired, you can have more salt in the body, and as you know very well, the pressure naturesis mechanism will kick in to maintain sodium homeostasis at the expense of blood pressure. Correct. And so what we believe is we found a mechanism that is critically important. It's activated across multiple salt-resistant phenotypes, and it's absent in a salt-sensitive phenotype, the dull salt-sensitive ferret. Ah, so yeah, interesting. As I'll describe this afternoon, we've actually found a genetic way through collaborators at Medical College of Wisconsin to restore this pathway in a salt-sensitive phenotype and we show a significant attenuation of the hypertension, the sympathoexcitation, and the sodium retention, suggesting this could be a very good future therapeutic target for, say, biased agonism. So you give compounds that would signal preferentially down a specific downstream signal transduction pathway. 
and it also ties in beautifully to single nucleotide polymorphisms that have been discovered in humans. Ah. So this could lead to a preclinical diagnostic tool or screening mechanism for susceptibility to hypertension, in particular salt-sensitive hypertension. You know, obviously you have thought a lot about and pay a lot of attention to the potential mm -hmm. application of what you're doing. I mean, Absolutely. most of us are basic scientists and oftentimes we don't, in getting involved in our projects, we don't really think about that. Clearly this is not the way you've conducted your research, that so you're interested in developing uh, therapeutic applications that might be uh, used, uh, capitalizing on your discovery. I think it's important, I and mean, the way the NIH is going, it has to be translational and it makes sense. We're funded by the public. Yeah. If the public aren't seeing a health benefit, I can understand why there will be questions <laughs> about what we're doing. Absolutely. But one in three people has high blood pressure. We all know that. Yeah. And there's not been that many large therapeutic breakthroughs in recent years. There's not. I'm at Boston University in the Department of Pharmacology right now where Harry Gavris is. Yeah. He invented the ARBs. Yes. It's been a long time since we've had that kind of significant breakthrough in therapeutics. That's an so excellent point. How, so tell me, how did you discover this pathway? I assume it's a molecular it's mechanism. It's a central molecular mechanism, and I discovered it purely thanks to my old boss. Yeah. I moved to LSU, and my old boss, Dr. Capoust, was mm -hmm. working with opioid compounds. And it was, he'd done the beautiful elegant pharmacology, the traditional knockout route. It's one ligand, it's one receptor, it can be fully antagonized, but it does multiple things. You give it in an animal, in the brain, ICV, it will drop blood pressure, it drops heart rate, it retains sodium, and it causes diuresis. How can all of that happen with <laughs> like one receptor, one pathway? And so he said, go and figure out the molecular pathways. That was Excellent. why he hired me. There's he wanted to apply my molecular biology with his whole animal physiology. Excellent. And he said, go and look at MAP kinases, ERX, junks. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. Let's <laughs> step back a bit. It was the pioneering work of Bob Levkowitz, who's now mm. won the Nobel. Yes. Beta resting pathways. And I just took, sat there and basically stared at the GPCR signaling. It's alpha, beta, gamma subunit signal transduction after ligand binding. No. It's not been taken any further than that. And so I used the pioneering work of Pasternak in opioid behavior to selectively use oligodeoxynucleotides to take out the individual alpha subunit signal transduction pathways. And by Very doing clever. that, we pulled out functional selectivity. And we can isolate G-alpha-Z and G-alpha-Q pathways to regulate the secretion of vasopressin in response to salt intake, in response to pharmacology. And we also found that the alpha subunits, the IO, we inhibited them using pertussis toxin, are critical for dropping blood pressure, for evoking hypotension. Mm. And Dr. Capusta and I had a conversation, which changed my <laughs> career, really. We sat down and he's like, I can't do everything. I'm interested in vasopressin, I'm a renal guy. Go make a name for yourself in high blood pressure. And he let me take and tease out the GI or the GO pathways that regulate blood pressure. And so that involved breaking it down to the I1, the I2, the I3, the O, the S, and it was just a picking them apart, teasing out which one does what, and I got lucky. I think we all get lucky <laughs> at some points. <laughs> we have to. And that's, I'd rather be, I'd like to be both good and lucky, <laughs> but you need that luck. How long did it take you to get to where you are in this process now, the development of the project you're working on now? Because obviously it's been a bit it of moved, time involved. It moved rapidly. I think the key thing that we all acknowledge is you need to have the time to just essentially sit there and stew it over <laughs> and kick around the idea. This wasn't the first project I tried. Hmm. I mean, you're gonna have failures, you learn from them, right? Yes. So I was fortunate enough, I'd been a postdoc for a couple of years, and Dan said, you completed what I wanted you to do. Take the summer, go and go find yourself a project, and it worked. I started okay. off doing it very simply with one ligand, one receptor, the alpha-2 adrenal receptors. We've published extensively on that now, and we've proven if you take out this GI2 pathway, you prevent a drop in blood pressure, and you prevent naturesis. So you've got a direct link there, and I was kind of sitting down, and I'm like, this is really interesting. <laughs> but how is that going to turn into a career for me? when is sodium excretion important? And that was when like, the light bulb went off and I was like, salt-sensitive hypertension. And so we then did, as everybody does, the basic steps. This is acute, it's not long-term, it's not that applicable to human health. That could have been a phenomenon for one ligand and one receptor. Sure. So I did the very simple step, which I'll talk about later this afternoon, I just gave a salt-resistant phenotype. In my case, I used the Sprague Dooley because it was there and it was easy. And I fed them high salt. I was figuring if it has an important role in sodium excretion, maybe we'd see some changes. You have to see some changes, yeah. So what we did is I then took the brain out and I did immunoblotting for every single G-alpha subunit I could imagine in all the known neural control centers. So I was looking at the hypothalamic paraventricular nucleus, the VLM, the NTS, the S, you name <laughs> it. Fortunately for me, I found a significant change only in one brain region, only in the protein I'm targeting. It's upregulated about tenfold in the hypothalamic PDN. Fantastic. Nowhere else. But then again, and this is great training for any other scientists listening, you may have seen a change, but does it mean anything? So to prove it has function, we had to take it out and see if there's a problem. 
And that's when, just by taking out this one protein, I'm going to show you taking it out globally, centrally in the brain today due to time limitations, you've evoked salt-sensitive hypertension in a brown Norway phenotype, in a dull salt resistant, in a Sprague Dorley, the traditional classical models of salt resistance. If you take it out in the dull salt sensitive, which does not regulate this protein on high salt, you exacerbate the hypertension. So it has a role across multiple animal phenotypes, and restoring it is critical. Sounds very, very exciting, and it sounds very uh, technically uh, accomplished, challenging, uh, and utilizing you know, sort of traditional methods of physiology, mm -hmm. more modern methods of molecular biology, which have been applied in a lot of organs in the body, but not so much in the brain. So I, you know, no. I personally, of course, I like <laughs> to see this kind of work being not too many people are doing this in the brain. No. So it's, it, it is really exceptionally exciting and very much looking forward to seeing all the details this Thank afternoon. You. And for our viewers, if you would like to be able to experience in this kind of science uh, in person, uh, please, please uh, come next year to our meeting in San Francisco in September. That, that is our 2014 meeting of the High Blood Pressure Council. Thank you very much for uh, being with us today.